All right. Good morning. Great to have you here. We have had a wonderful reception last night and a glorious breakfast this morning. It's just a great privilege to welcome Dr. Muhammad Yunus to the campus, and we're in for a great, great day. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Cynthia Tom Smedley, our Director of Global Education. Cynthia is in her first year with us. She earned her BS from Messiah College, her MS from Boston University, and her PhD from Azusa Pacific University. She's had extensive work overseas, uh, setting up global study programs, as well as doing a great deal of research and writing of her own. Cynthia, thank you for coordinating today's panel and working with our students as they prepared uh, to interview and uh, engage Dr. Yunus. Dr. Cynthia Tom Smedley. Thank you, Dr. Beebe. Let me add my own special welcome to our many visitors and guests and students as you gather with us today to join in this conversation. The man that we are about to welcome to this stage is not only able to bring microcredit to millions around the world, he's also somehow managed to bring rain to Santa Barbara. For those of you coming from the President's Breakfast, you can attest that hearing from Muhammad this morning felt more like a fireside chat than a presentation. So we're glad you're here. I think we're in for a real treat this morning. It's my honor and privilege to welcome and introduce Dr. Muhammad Yunus. In 2006, Dr. Yunus and the Grameen Bank was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for giving microcredit loans to women. Other awards have followed. In April of this past year, he was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal and in that speech, it was pointed out, he is the only person in the world to have received the Nobel Peace Prize, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and the Congressional Gold Medal. Please join me this morning in welcoming Dr. Mohammed Yunus to our stage. Thank you. Thank you. Before our students begin with their questions, let me take a moment to highlight Dr. Yunus's progression from economics professor to effective activist against global poverty. From classroom theories to making a real difference with real people in the real world. As the third of 14, excuse me, Dr. Yunus is known as a person who does not turn away from challenges. In his reception speech of the Nobel Peace Prize, he remarked, I became involved because poverty was all around me. I could not turn away from it. I wanted to do something immediate to help people around me. Even if it was just one human being to get through one day with a little more ease. As the third of 14 children, Muhammad encountered poverty and hunger in his native Bangladesh, the most densely populated country on earth. After completing his PhD in economics from Vanderbilt University, he returned to Bangladesh where he encountered women making bamboo stools. Despite their daily toil, they were unable to make more than a penny of profit per day. Since banks would not lend to the poor, these women had no hope of building their business and lifting themselves and their families out of the trap of poverty. This was the moment that Dr. Yunus chose not to turn away. He believed that the women could grow their business if they only had access to capital. Since the banks would not give them loans, he chose to give them the loans himself. And the results were stunning. The women paid back the loans in full, on time, every time. So Dr. Yunus decided to create a separate bank for the poor. And in 1983, the Grameen Bank or the Village Bank, as it's known locally, was born. His vision for this bank was built on two fundamental beliefs, that all people deserve access to capital, and that access to capital can transform communities. Today, 30 years later, 
more than 250 institutions in over 100 countries offer microcredit services based on the Grameen Bank system. I've had the privilege to witness firsthand these transformative effects of Dr. Yunus's principles of microcredit while living in Uganda and China. The bank now currently has eight and a half million borrowers. 97% are women. And the return rate for the loans is an astounding 97%. Along with his pioneering efforts in microcredit, Dr. Yunus has inspired many students to pursue the study of social business. In fact, three of his own students became top executives in the Grameen Bank, and they were with him on the day that he accepted his Nobel Peace Prize. So it's in that spirit that we are delighted to have Dr. Yunus here to engage our own students who have been inspired and studied his work and have been intrigued by all that he's been able to accomplish. I'd like to introduce those students to you today. First on my right is Christabel Stark. Christabel is a graduating senior studying international security and development. Christabel became an advocate for microfinance through her experiences interning with several microfinance organizations. Next to her is James Sievers. James will graduate Westmont this May with a BA in economics and business and minors in both music and religious studies. He's currently participating in a new Westmont course aimed at reaching an impoverished community in Haiti. Next to James is Andy Wood. Andy is a senior English major with a minor in history who grew up in the rural area of Ometepec, Mexico. He is currently discovering what it means to be a global citizen at Westmont, and he hopes to continue this pursuit in years to come. Finally, uh, to his right, Ka'ai Nguyen is a senior year biology and business double major, and she intends to pursue healthcare administration at a clinic for lower income families. Now, Christabel will start us off with our first question for Dr. Yunus. Good morning, Dr. Yunus. You've been called the father of microfinance. We've heard the story of how you were moved to help women in Bangladesh. Can you tell us what other significant milestones or experiences sparked your thinking in the development of microfinance? Well, I'd say that uh, the circumstances that existed at that time, mm -hmm. that's uh, one that pushed me into that direction. Um, I was teaching in one of the universities in Bangladesh. I was uh, at the economics department. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> poverty is uh, all over Bangladesh, uh, extreme poverty. Uh, and then uh, there was a famine in the country. So that's when uh, <clears throat> the whole shock began that whatever I teach to me it looks like a useless thing that I do because it makes no difference to people's life that live around me. So instead of just to talk about economics, I just went out to the people who live next door and to try to see, since economics is not working for them, as a human being, if I can make myself useful. So that's how the whole process began. And I was not trying to change the world. I was just trying to change one person's life one day. Yeah. So if I can do something about it. And luckily, uh, I did something, it worked, because, uh, uh, because of the loan sharking, I thought uh, I can stop the loan sharking and save them from the loan sharks by lending myself. So why don't I lend myself? Just take money from my pocket and start lending money. So it's not waiting for somebody to create a big project out of it. It's not like, nothing like that. It's just a personal thing I did. And it worked. People were excited about it. So I continued with it. That's how the whole process began. Thank you. In your work and in your writing, you distinguish between charity and social business. How does your model of social business differ from charity or social entrepreneurship as we see it today? Yeah. I, I was uh, just telling in the morning that every time I see a problem, and I saw a lot of problems, and I uh, came out with an idea to solve that problem by creating a business. I create a business uh, to address that problem in a sustainable way. So this is a basic thing for me. And I created lots of those companies after uh, company after company, each one focused on solving one problem. Then. I, people point out to me, you have so many big companies in the country, you must be a very rich man. 
I said, I never thought about it. I I'm not a rich man. I said, why not? You, re you have so many companies that you created. I said, I created the company, but I never intended to make a penny out of them. So that was not my intention. My intention was to solve the problem in a sustainable way. That's how we turned into, we made into a business. So that's what uh, formally started defining it by saying it's a non-dividend company to solve human problems. So you pick up a problem and create a business to solve that in, in a way that you recover the cost so that you can reinvest the money and continue to do the job. The difference between a philanthropy and a social business will be in philanthropy, uh, you address a problem by giving the money uh, in a way it solves it, but the money doesn't come back. So you have one-time use of the money. And it's excellent work, but does it only once. If you want to do that again, you need a fresh amount of money to do the same thing again, to keep it alive again. So, uh, and it's a very difficult task to raise money again and again. Just people get tired of it, uh, you know, at one point. Um, so I thought, why don't you use it as a business methodology? So that you do it in a way you cover your cost. And then it becomes a self-sustaining. So that's what the social business is all about. And social business money has endless life because it never disappears. You are creating a company, it's almost like you're creating an economic machine which runs by itself. It doesn't need any refueling from outside. It not only doesn't need a refueling from outside, it has a capacity to expand itself. So that's the power of the social business. And it's very effective in uh, solving problems. Uh, you also asked about the uh, social entrepreneur. Social entrepreneur is a very broad term. Social entrepreneur could be even engaged in non-economic activity. It has nothing to do with economics. So it could be a social entrepreneur. Or he could be or she could be uh, involved in profit-making company, but does something which is uh, impacting in people's life. But he makes money out of that. So that's a social entrepreneur too. Or he could be engaged in NGO activity, non-profit activities, uh, charity activities. Uh, he is a social entrepreneur. So social entrepreneurship uh, fits into many, many situations. But social business is a very unique part of that whole democratic activity. It's a business, <clears throat> it's a self-financing, and uh, it solves a problem. So these are the characteristics. Thank you. Dr. Yunus, your contribution to the fight against poverty is inspiring, and I am sure challenging at times. What has been the fiercest opposition, and what keeps you motivated to overcome it? That opposition or those oppositions? Well, you said it's exciting, so excitement is the one <laughs> which keeps you motivated. You don't give up. And uh, when uh, people ask me what, the, what is the most important thing which worked for you when you were doing microcredit, building a microcredit, I said maybe stubbornness. <laughs> Everybody says it because it's not going to work. And you said, don't care, I do it, it will work. <laughs> and uh, people have always said in a negative way, even when they see something is happening right in front of your eyes, still they will say, maybe it's working today, tomorrow it will not work. Or they will say, well, it can work in this village, but it will not work in other villages. Because this village is so close to the university, they are got used to your way of doing things, the next village or the village, uh, distant village will not be able to cope with that kind of thing. So they will, it will never work. So you do the second village, it works. They say maybe two villages can work, but five villages will not work. Because your mind is set not to accept, you, you always screen things that doesn't fit into your mindset. So this becomes something questioned. Uh, or it say it can work in Bangladesh, but it will not work anywhere else then it works everywhere else. Then I say, well, it can work in the poor countries, but it will not work in rich countries. Then it works in rich countries. They say, well, it could reach, uh, work for a while, but that will not work. You do not want to accept. So you got used to it. You see that because it's something new, and you feel very strongly about it, and you are very clear what you're doing, and you continue. 
Otherwise, uh, naysayers will take over and say it's over. It cannot be done. So this is, I think, it's a very important point to uh, stay on course if you are convinced that uh, it is good for people and it's, uh, your logic uh, works and you pursue that. So this is how the microcredit is not only 100 countries now, it's all over the world. There is hardly any country in the world which doesn't have this microcredit in program in their countries. So it, uh, you cannot now distinguish between rich country, poor country, north country, left, left south country, nothing. It's everywhere. So it works in all circumstances. Still people don't accept it as a banking proposition. Still it works with the NGOs. Banks have not adopted it because they said, no, 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 that's not the kind of job we should do. I don't understand why not. So these are the barriers we have to cross because the banking has to become universal. Banking has to become inclusive. Nobody should be left out of the financial system. And the problems are created, the poverty and everything, because of the wrong formulation of the institutions that we built around us. That was the thing. And I give the example of bonsai tree, the little tree that you get in a little pot. I said, this, there is nothing wrong with the seed, but we put it in a flower pot. That's how it becomes a small. I said, poor people are bonsai people. There's nothing wrong with their seed. Simply society never gave them the space to grow as tall as everybody else. So we have to build those institutions and policies which let everybody grow as tall as everybody else. Thank you. Certainly one challenge that microfinance faces in Bangladesh and beyond is the social structure of the family. How do you try to reach women who were prohibited by their husbands from taking loans? Also, how do you and the Grameen Bank encourage men to step up in their families and take responsibility for the well-being of their wives and children? Well, it's very difficult when uh, you address the problem of the women. And one of the greatest barriers that we had in our work, because we are focusing on women, and it generated opposition from many directions. The first opposition came from the very family that we are addressing, the husband. Husband was opposed to the fact that we are addressing the women in the family, not him. He thought banks should address him, not his wife. He gets very agitated, very upset about it. Uh, it took a lot of time to try to calm him down. That uh, Initially, there are a lot of problems because uh, we are doing that. So we had to go through lots of preparation with the men in the family, uh, explaining to them why we do that. And in a very interesting way, the way they can participate with us, sympathize with us. Uh, and finally, they get through. But they always, if after all this preparation from both the women's side and also men's side, when we begin, first year is a very difficult year. Men cannot accept the fact that women is handling money. He thinks he's the only one who should handle money, not the wife. So he has to restrain himself, and women has to be very careful so that she doesn't irritate uh, the husband. Uh, after she successfully paid the first loan, the husband starts thinking differently. Because in the beginning he thinks she, the bank gave her the loan, but she won't be able to pay because she doesn't know anything. I'm the only one who knows. Uh, so sooner or later, I'll have to pay the money. And she, he waits when wife is approaching him to give the money to pay the installment. The wife doesn't come to him. She's doing that, she said, maybe next week she will come. And next week she doesn't come. And finally, after 52 weeks, she has paid everything. So suddenly, the real, husband realizes that his wife is not as uh, unprepared as he thought, as uh, um, uninitiated as he thought. He, she has some skill that she, he, never, he was not aware of. So gradually, he starts admiring her capacity. He doesn't admit it but he realizes that he has more insight than he thought. But when he becomes more and more successful, the relationship transforms completely. The husband gradually accepts her role. In many families, uh, wife's income has become a major income in the family. Uh, so he realizes that how things are changing. Uh, this is on the family side. Then we had the problem with the religious side. 
uh, in our religion, Muslim religion, uh, the interpretation of our cleric says that uh, women should not be in business. Women should stay home and uh, should not be seen outside the home. And that's a traditional way in the villages people interpreted religion. So we came in conflict with that. They were very opposed to us. They said they were destroying the religion. So we had to cope with this. Religion is a very sensitive issue when you deal with the, everywhere. Uh, the, uh, the religious people are saying you are against religion and suddenly everybody is opposed to you. So we had to come up with the good responses. But one thing which worked very well with us, the history of religion. And we always repeat this, explaining that uh, the prophet, prophet's first wife was a businesswoman. Uh, he actually, as a young person, he started working for her uh, in her business. So he helped her in her business, and later he married her. So I said, if you want to be a good Muslim, you have to follow the footsteps of the prophet. You do whatever the prophet did. And that's what a good Muslim should be. So in that case, you should be, mar you should be marrying a businesswoman. <laughs> And if you don't find business women around you, come and talk to us. We have a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> so they got the message. And it's such a historical fact that they cannot challenge that. So I said, you should be encouraging your daughter to become a businesswoman, because that's what the prophet admired. So this is how it worked. Dr. Yunus, in the documentary, Bonsai People, you say that credit is a human right but rights are always accompanied by duties. So if credit is a right, whose duty is it to provide this credit? Well, food is a right, work is a right, whose duty is it? Uh, one, as a community, as a society, is a combined duty of us all to make sure that all human rights are respected and established. But sometimes it cannot be done, it cannot happen so easily because even the society or the community or the nation tries to do that, they don't have enough resources to do that. So I said the important thing is to enable people to implement that while you're trying to create circumstances with your right to food, right to work, right to shelter, all this comes in. But at the same time, you should be helping people to do that. And I have been saying that right to credit should also be a human right. This is missed in the Charter of Human Rights. I said it should be included into that. An explanation that I gave, that it's so important, right to credit, that if you have the establish, that credit established, then other, establishing other rights becomes so much easier. Because if you establish the right to credit, then right to food becomes easier, because I can earn money by using the credit, and then I take care of my food. And then it becomes easier to right to shelter, I can create my own home, uh, right to work, because I'm self-employed, so all these things become so much easier, provided you address the first one, right to credit. How do you do that? Create an institution. Like the banks, is a business. It's not a charity, but the banks close the door for the poor people. Almost two-thirds of the world population, two-thirds of the world population, do not qualify to do business with banks. So what kind of institution is that? And we accept that, as if that's the only way it can happen. I said, no. That's not the only way it can happen. We demonstrated that other ways can happen. You can take anybody and lend money to them. And as a, as a kind of demonstration, we started lending money to the beggars, beggars on the street. We do that. And we have a huge number of beggars borrowing money. It's the simple thing we did with them. We told them that as you go from house to house begging for food, for money, why don't you carry some merchandise with you as you go around? Sell something, some food, some snacks, some uh, toys for the kids, uh, some fruits uh, for the people. Take something with you. So you have two things to sell. One, something to sell as a real, or just ask for uh, something as you do, with a bag, do that. So let people give a cho you give people choices. So they will take either, either one or both, that doesn't matter. And people like that idea. And we started giving them the money to buy the stuff to sell. So they became door-to-door -door -door salesperson and doing good business. An usual loan in Bangladesh for us, uh, for a startup uh, beggar, 
to become door-to-door -door salesperson would be something like $15. With $15, you are turning a beggar into a business person. So this is how, can we, and it pays back the money. We had no problem. So this is, this is the story that the microcredit that it happens all over the world, including, as I was mentioning in the morning, we have two branches right here in Los Angeles. One is the Boyle Heights, that the one branch, another is Westlake. There are two branches operating. One, the uh, Boyle Heights branch is working for just about a year now. We, they have now 500 borrowers and work beautifully. And the other one, second branch, just started a month back. So two right near here. So it, it works in every circumstances. So we have to redesign the system. That's where our problem is. Uh, the system has caused us all our problem. People didn't cause the problem. So we have to go back to the drawing board. So where do we have to fix it? And now that credit system has been fixed by microfinance. But it's still you cannot match this because still the banks denied access to two-thirds of the world population. Why? What is to be done? These are the questions now we have to resolve. Why should microfinance should come from the NGOs and so on, and the banks will merrily do whatever they're doing? Ignore completely the existence of the two-thirds of the population. That's the big question. In your model for social business, you outline profit sharing and business ownership among the poor. What happens to the poor individual who shares in profits but then crosses the threshold and is no longer, by your definition, considered poor? How do you manage the profit sharing and ownership as you begin to bring people out of poverty? The Grameen Bank is an example. Uh, Grameen Bank is owned by the borrowers. So they are the one social business because the borrowers are poor people, they own it. But gradually they're moving out of poverty. And all of them will come out of poverty. So that doesn't mean that uh, it is the end of the story because they still, they came from that root and continue. So it becomes a social business as, as, as an example of a social business because it, is, it used to be the, the former poor people still own this company and so on. And by the way, uh, there is a, there's a Millennium Development Goals, a set of goals that we have to achieve by 2015. And goal number one is to reduce poverty by half by 2015. So at the beginning when it was adopted by the United Nations, everybody said, oh, this is a crazy uh, goal which will be never met and United Nations will forget and move on to something else. But I was very excited about it, that yes, this is a very concrete proposal, concrete uh, objective they have set. And now 15 is coming. It's only one year left. Uh, 31st December 2015 will be the end period. And what are the countries doing? Have they reduced poverty by half by this time? And we have been tracking Bangladesh case, whether it's coming to that end. And we are always very happy that it was at, at the level that it should be in each year, so that uh, we felt comfortable. But we were surprised a little bit when we actually came to half po point in June of last year. So we achieved a reduction of poverty by half, one and a half year before the target date. So this is an exciting news because what you thought in the beginning, an unachievable objective. Now in a country which has ex had extremely poor people, now they have reduced poverty by half by 2013. So this is a good example of how you can reach out to people, they can reduce their own poverty, they can change their own life, and that's, that's the challenging fact that we have to work with. Virtually all organizations, whether they are profit, not-for-profit, or microfinance entities, have some degree of corruption. This often occurs when organizations take advantage of those who they are supposed to help. How will the social, social business model be protected from this kind of abuse? Well, corruption is uh, beyond social business and everything. It's something what you structure, what you design. Uh, Bangladesh is uh, recognized as a corrupt country by the Transparency International Index. And it had been uh, number one corrupt country in the world for five years in a row. And then it went to the second position and third position and so on. But that didn't change much out of all the countries remaining in the second and third position. It doesn't make big difference. Uh, what does it mean that Bangladesh is a corrupt country? 
It doesn't mean Bangladesh people are corrupt. You have to distinguish between people and the country. Uh, it talk, when you talk about the index of corruption, you're talking about the big businesses, corruption. Uh, you're talking about the government, corrupt. So those who are involved, there's a very few people out of 160 million people in Bangladesh. But the general people of Bangladesh are very honest people. And you can see uh, uh, Grameen Bank itself is an example. There is no police to take money from the people to bring it to the bank, or nobody's beating them up to get the money from people to pay back. They do it, there's no collateral, no compulsion of any kind. If you don't pay, you're not punished for that. In many banks, you have a very strict rule, if you don't pay, what are the punishment you'll be facing? We don't have such thing. We don't say if you don't pay, these are the punishment waiting for you, no punishment. We actually become more helpful to people who cannot pay, rather than moving away because we say, we build a bank for them because they have the more trouble. So we would be going out to help them to make sure they are successful. Success doesn't come in one go. It, it fails and you try again and then finally make it success. So we are always mindful of that. Uh, so coming back to the corruption, in, in that environment of corruption in the government, corruption in the big businesses, we run the Grameen Bank. We handle cash all the time. Millions of dollars worth of money we handle carrying cash back and forth because I mean, bank's principle is people should not come to the bank. Banks should go to the people. So we go to the people, collect the money, and carry it back to our office, which is a distant place from where we are working. So everybody knows how much money we're carrying. Each staff would be carrying something like 30,000, 35,000, 40,000 taka. It's almost like carrying 30,000 dollars with you and walking by five miles to carry this money. It would be very attractive uh, object for anybody to stop him, uh, show a knife or show a revolver or something, give me the money. And money will be gone. It doesn't happen. We do it millions of times. It doesn't happen. Very safely, they go and come and so on. So I would say uh, corruption, in Bangladesh everybody agrees that Grameen Bank is a corruption-free institution. So we could create a huge nationwide corruption-free institution in a country where institutions are suspect. Particularly if it's a government institution, it's a very highly suspect that it is the den of corruption and so on. So it goes side by side. You can create, it's all, in, in, it's what is in your intention, what kind of institution you want to build. And you, if your intentions are right, it gets done. And this is the example, not only Grameen Bank, now there are many microcredit programs which are working in Bangladesh. All of them have the same result. How can the principles of microfinance be applied to the urban and rural America, especially since costs are significantly greater here? Well, I was just giving an example right here in your neighborhood. Uh, we work in New York City since 2008. We have now six branches. Each one came after a while because at the beginning we were not sure where and how we would start. We didn't have enough money to start. Uh, the first branch was in Jackson Heights. And Jackson Heights branch came to break even point last year. So which is a good news. So all those just words that it's expensive, it's this, it's that. That's the argument we have been hearing from day one. It will be, in, in the United States, you cannot have a sustainable microcredit program. It is impossible. And then if you are addressing the bottom poor people, where your loan size is so small, if you go a little up, your loan size get big, maybe you become sustainable at that level, not at the grassroots level. We always work with the very bottom. So we made sure if you're going to be successful, we have to be successful with our own mission. Not because something happened, we have to start there, we are not there. And that is the success. Average loan in uh, Jackson Heights branch is $1,500. So you can imagine how small the loan size is. Uh, and with that loan size, you come to break even point. So this gets us very excited. This, and in the first branch, you are very slow, you take a lot of time, you want to make sure everything goes right. In the second branch, you'll be probably much less time will become 
break we come to the break even point so all these six branches we will see our lines say that we will have dates when we will become uh, sustainable and we repeat this when we come to los angeles and so on because we have not much more experience now much more confident now then we we started jackson high branch so it's possible all i would say there's first first of all don't take anything as impossible there's nothing call impossible it's a question of how you do it uh, it's a matter of time to break through things which were impossible 10 years back around the world today is a routine thing you never thought about it if somebody say 20 years back everybody in the world would be carrying a phone in their pocket they will think it's crazy it's it you know, going to happen it's such a difficult time even to get a connection in bangladesh 20 years back, no not me <laughs> okay uh, they didn't like my telephone example <laughs> uh, in 20 years back the only only way you can have a phone is a government company telephone company <laughs> it it will usual waiting time to get a telephone connection is two and a half years waiting time and you have to bribe so many people to get the connection today you just buy it and go work out you see everybody has it all over we have 160 million people in bangladesh we had 15 million sorry 115 million telephone subscribers so you can imagine in every family there are multiple phones whether you're a rich family poor family doesn't matter because the telephone is so cheap everybody can afford it see so even the beggars have their telephone in their pocket so what can you do so this is the way so i'm saying that we should not take anything as impossible it's a question of designing it's a question of refining your structure and so on so it can have it can be done thank you dr Dr. Yunus, you're speaking to a room filled largely with American 20-somethings. What role should we play in the microfinance sector, both now and as we begin our careers? Well, I should not limit it to microfinance. Yes, there's so many other things to be done. So I would I would say it in a different in a way that it applies to anybody. Uh, one thing I strongly feel that the, the young generation today is a very powerful generation. and i even go out to say is the most powerful generation of young people in the entire history of mankind why do we say that and what does it distinguish from the other generation our generation when we, we were at your age we didn't have the technology we could not communicate with each other we had to write in a long hand we used to have pen you don't have any more <laughs> we used to have papers and write the letters and put it in an envelope and buy postage stamp <laughs> stick it there lick it stick it you don't lick those stamps anymore <laughs> and then put it in a post box today only post box you know is in the computer you see the real post box out there and wait and wait two months three months four months to get a reply and you're so excited when you got the envelope delivered to you those days are gone nobody is waiting for any envelope to appear there is instantaneous communication around the world you type it up it goes and comes back right away replies come out this is a speed and not only just communication access to information access to knowledge we used to spend hours and hours and hours in the library you don't know where the library is probably <laughs> this used to be something called library one time <laughs> and just to find one piece of information you have spent hours and hours and hours going through books and pages and pages to find that information today you click it exactly what you want is there you save hours and hours of time you have the books and things at your fingertips information at your fingertips so that makes you a completely different kind of person you are communicate you have a friend friends everywhere the social media transformed another kind of thing so that gives you tremendous power 
The question I raise with the young people like you, are you aware that you are a different kind of human being? You are not the same human being that the history has known. You are a different kind of human being. You can almost be called, you are superhuman being. Like the superman, you can just do anything you want. You have that power. First of all, you have to become aware that you are superhuman being. Once you become aware, the next question you should be asking yourself, what am I going to do with my power? If you don't use your power, it will be just wasted. So, my appeal to you, become aware that you are a super person and make sure you use it right from today. Don't wait for tomorrow. People will tell you, you are the leaders of future and so on and so on. Don't wait for future. You are already the leaders. Take it up. Don't leave it to the other generation who do not have that capacity that you have. And the world will be very different in your hand if you put your mind into it. So do whatever you want to do. First find out what you want to do because it will be too late to do it tomorrow. You do it today. This is what I'm going to do. And it will happen. Today it will look like impossible. And the more it will look like impossible, more you know that's what will happen to you and you will make it possible. That's it. As simple as that. There is the distance between the possible and the impossible. There is a distance. That distance is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So this is your chance to make the list of impossible shorter and shorter and shorter. And that will happen. Whether you do it or not, it will happen. It may take longer time if you don't do it. But if you do it, it will be shorter time. And it will be done in your lifetime. It's not, you do, not even in your lifetime, in your halfway, half, halfway your lifetime. It will be all done. We'll say, we have solved all the problems. You have anything left? People will be looking around, is there any other problem left? You can solve that. And don't take anything as impossible because you say, that's my pleasure. I solve all the impossible things. I make impossible possible. That's my specialty. That's what the young generation should be doing. Dr. Yunus, to wrap up our conversation here this morning, what goals do you have for yourself in the coming decade? Well, <laughs> to get into your mind. <laughs> <laughs> get you to feel that you have that power. Once I can successfully do that, my mission is accomplished. The rest will happen. I don't have to worry about it. But get it into your mind is the most important thing because you are coming in a family of the old generation. They think in a very different way. They th we think in a prehistoric way. You are thinking in a way of future. So that future is completely different. First, you design what kind of future you want. That's very important. Because if you design, it will happen. You have to imagine. Imagination is the key. Imagine all the things you want to see in the world to take place. This is the kind of world. Be as bold as you want to be in that imagination. If you just imagine, just imagine, I can guarantee you it will happen. If you don't imagine, it will not happen. So power of imagination is fantastic. That's why people are writing science fiction all the time, many, many years. They were fictionalizing that they can go to the moon. And they wrote books about it, they wrote stories about it, and all kinds of things to go to the moon. And finally, people went to the moon. At that time, when they're writing those fictions, this was so impossible that they had to call it fiction, that it's not something that you can do it in real terms. So we, we have fiction, science fiction. We have uh, movies, we have uh, serials in the television, uh, Star Trek and all this stuff. And these are fictions. But science always followed science fiction. What was in the fiction? We said, why not? Let's try to do that. And all this will start happening. All the things we do today was some, some form were in the fictions, but we made it happen. But unfortunately, we are not writing social fictions. And I'm encouraging everybody to write social fiction. What would be life like where there is no unemployment, there is no poor people, there is no fight, there is no distance with each other. 
make a science fiction or social fiction. Write books, have a television series on that. It will happen because it will get into our head and make it happen. So this is the imagination that which is the most critical thing to make things happen. And once we start doing that, we are on the right track. I want to thank I want to thank each of our panelists and everyone in our audience for being with us here today. Our time today was generously supported by the Westmont Foundation, so I want to thank them for their investment in our students as thoughtful scholars and faithful servants. And finally, Dr. Yunus, it's an incredible privilege well, to hear from you, you this morning. Uh, through your work and your decades of success with the Grameen Bank, you have inspired us and allowed us a shift in our understanding of development economics, and we are so grateful. Thank you. Please join me in a final round of applause for thanking Dr. Yunus. Thank you.